Okay, welcome runners. This is Coach Michael Merlino with In Flight Running in Houston, Texas. And in this webinar, we're going to kind of go over what I call my final countdown tips. These are primarily for the Houston Marathon folks, but uh, these tips could be used for any, to kind of gear up for any major marathon. And I'm talking more so like, you know, like two, two and a half weeks prior to the to marathon. So here in Houston, our marathon this year is on January 13th. It's the um, 20, 27th of December, so about two weeks out. We're going to go over some tips to kind of get you guys ready for uh, race day, okay? So for you guys that don't know me, I'm Coach Michael Merlino. As I mentioned, I'm a Houston-based marathon coach, certified fitness trainer for 15 years, a running coach, a marathon coach for about 12 years and I train a, a pretty wide variety of, of both fitness clients and runners here in the greater Houston area, okay? So first off, uh, for those, this would kind of be geared towards both our current members and those of you guys that may be tuning in on Facebook that may pull this up on YouTube. So, But uh, as far as our members, or for all you guys out there that have been kind of training for a winter or early you know, early um, 2013 race. I just want to congratulate you on having a, a great season. And for those that are training with us, I'm glad you kind of chose us as your team. Um, if you've been training, sticking to any marathon schedule for six to eight weeks, you know, obviously you're probably a lot healthier. Hopefully you've you've lost some weight and managed your weight a little bit more because, you know, lighter runners run faster, as you, as you probably know. Um, you know, it just takes a lot of guts and determination to kind of stick to the schedule. Many hours, many miles on the road. Here in Houston, if you're if you're training anywhere in the south, of course, you've got added heat and humidity, and we've had tons of that this year in Houston. And then, of course, it takes, takes a village, so it takes coaching, it takes running buddies, and, of course, your, your, your friends and your family, all that support to kind of get through the season. So... Work is not done yet. We're about two weeks out, but the tough stuff's over. And now that we go into taper mode, I want to give you guys some tips to kind of, as we lead up to race day, just doing those small things right that really can make a huge difference in what you guys do on race day and how you perform. Okay, so let's get moving here. So, yeah, the, the training's done. Now it's just time to earn some medals. And as I mentioned earlier, it's just doing those early things or those um, small things right. At this point, um, as you go into taper and carbo load, they're going to get you to the all-important finish line, okay? So today we want to kind of cover um, some final carbo loading tips, how to plan for different weather conditions that you guys may see on race day. And this this obviously would be any any race that you would run anywhere. Um, some helpful checklists that um, I'm going to not really go over in detail, but I can email you those later, um, you know, race day checklists, you know, what to put in your um, drop-off bag that you check in with the, with the race, you know, prior to your race, um, and how to run, how to run the, the uh, any type of marathon course, you know, race strategy be, beyond, um, you know, behind running a course well, and there's a, and there's a, there's a way to do that, that where you can, you know, squeeze a few minutes out and, and actually perform a few minutes better during the course. Um, you know, from the, from start to finish. Uh, kind of go over kind of a, a preview of the Houston course and, you know, how, how to run the race and what you can expect to see on, on race day as far as the terrain and tough spots on the course. And, um, of course, I'll, I'll go over details at the end, but those of you guys that are members will email you a great handout that kind of goes over all this information in more detail. And for you guys that aren't members, We'll give you an email address later that you can, uh, where you can email us direct, and we'll send that out to you. Okay. So Houston Marathon specifically, which we're going to kind of cover tonight. Um, yeah, this is just man, we love this time of year. This is kind of our busy time of year, and it's kind of our Super Bowl here in Houston as, as marathon coaches. We love this stuff. We love getting folks ready, seeing you guys, you know, kind of build up from. Some of you guys have actually throughout the course of the season gone from a three-mile run all the way up to a 23-mile run for the first time. So huge to get to this point. And Houston Marathon is, of course, Houston's largest annual sporting event. 
And this year we're celebrating the 41st anniversary of the Houston Marathon. In fact, this Sunday, December 30th, 2012, um, the first Houston Marathon was run around Memorial Park. So if you want to celebrate that and go running this Sunday, um, just know that back in 1972, 113 runners, and actually they had more spectators than runners, ran multiple loops around Memorial Park, which was the very first Houston Marathon. Um, last year, don't know what the stats are this year, but last year uh, 20, there was a field of 24,000. Probably a little bit less than that, you know, when you have dropouts and everything, about 5,000 volunteers and hundreds of thousands of spectators, of course, on the course. And um, runners from all 50 states and many Ford countries travel to Houston um, to, to run the race every year. And it's grown dramatically over the, you know, over the, over the past 40 years. So a little history there about the marathon. Um, you know, I always like to remind folks that whether you're training for your first marathon or your, your 20th marathon, you know, you guys are kind of the higher end of, um, uh, of, you know, fitness in, in the country. You know, one-tenth of one percent of Americans actually reach the start line of a marathon. So huge accomplishment there. Um, most of you guys have trained a minimum of six to eight months for your race, trying to learn how to do those little things right, learning how your body reacts to all this mileage, doing some interval training maybe, running some races and some warm-up races during the season to, to kind of tune up for your big race working on your nutrition, working through injuries and managing injuries to, uh, to even get to this point where you can actually get to the start line. So, um, as you know, you put a lot of work in so far and to get to that big day, and then you just got to hope a lot of things go, go in your favor. So, um, so just getting through these obstacles and just staying focused at this point, um, and it's tough in Houston because we just did our, our peak run last weekend, which was the weekend prior to Christmas. So just kind of getting through the holidays and keeping everything on track is pretty tough when you're training for a, like a winter race or an early, early year race. What does it take to get to the finish line? Well, getting to the start line is, you know, <clears throat> job one. If you've made it this far, then obviously you'll get to the start line. Get to the finish line is something entirely different. We've had great success with our training program. Um, with almost everyone that's, that's that's we've gotten to the start line, with the exception, I think, of four that I can think of over the the ten years, the ten plus years I've been coaching. Um, so yeah, it's it's a grueling 13.1 if you're doing a half, 26.2 even more so if you're doing a full marathon. And I always tell my runners, you know, once you get on that course, is smooth pacing, which we'll talk about, and just picking picking the miles off one at a time. Um, obviously, good weather. Is the one or weather is the one thing we can't control, but always, obviously here in Houston especially, we want a nice, cool, low humidity day, and that makes obviously makes things a heck of a lot easier to get to the finish line. Proper carbo loading and hydration. We'll get into that a little bit later, and you know obviously your your friends, your family, the rush of the crowd, people coming out and supporting you along the way really helps you kind of propel you to the finish line. Okay. Um, and just planning and mapping out your own race strategy as far as pacing, how you're going to kind of attack the course, knowing where the tough spots are, which we're going to go over. But in the end, honestly, man, it's all about heart and guts and a lot of mental toughness at the end when it gets kind of tough, so to get you to the finish line. Beyond that, you know, what's, what's cool about the, the marathon, it's just kind of a circle of life thing. I don't know. I mean, it, it, I think it's just a great, you know, triumph over adversity. Um, training for it's one thing, but, you know, even if you've, most of you guys have gone 20 plus miles, you haven't gone the total distance of a marathon if it's your first. You just never know how your body's going to react during that last 10K. So um, you just, sometimes you just got to gut it out at the end. It gets pretty tough. Um, just, it's just amazing how just through the human body, how, you know, with proper training, you guys can ratchet things up and progress from just a little baby run of, of a three-mile long run at the beginning all the way upwards of a 23-mile run, which our group did last week. And your body at this point is ready for the task at hand. Let's get to the finish line. So um, 
I love the sport of marathoning because it, it's really the only sport that I can think of where average people can get on the same course as the Kenyans, the professionals. You know, and the fact that those guys, if they win, they may get a good, get a free car, or they may get a big check. But the medal that those guys earn is really the same as what you guys earn. So it's kind of cool. You can't quite get in the same playing field with the Houston Texans or the Rockets, but when you're on a marathon course, you get to run the same course as the pros, which I think is kind of cool. Um, obviously, like I, like I mentioned earlier, your lungs, your heart, your legs are pretty much ready. <clears throat> but it's really getting your brain focused, especially at the end of the race when you really need it. And, of course, if you've trained, which, you know, if you guys have stuck to the schedule with our program or your own, wherever you, you train, you know, training obviously builds confidence, so you you are ready to go at this point, okay? Um, and who knows? For some of you guys, this may be your only marathon or half marathon, so you want to get out there, take care of business, and and go for it and run your race aggressively if you can do it, okay? And obviously, beyond that, you just want to take in the whole experience, especially it's your first, if, you, if it's your first marathon, and just have fun with it and, uh, because you know, you'll never forget your first marathon. Next, I want to go into kind of carbo loading because uh, if you guys have gotten your peak runs out of the way, you know, we're about two weeks out at this point. Um, two more baby long runs to go as we taper down for the marathon and, and, and the, the half marathon. Um, the one book that I would highly recommend you guys go out and buy, you can grab it on Amazon, uh, is Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook. Um, I had a chance to meet Nancy a few, uh, many years back, about 12 years back, and I've used her book. I think it's, I think it's in its fourth edition now. So if you find it online, make sure you 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 order the the most recent edition, I think, which I think is the fourth edition. Um, Nancy's a She's, she was a marathon herself at one point. She's been the nutritional consultant for the Boston Red Sox, the Boston Celtics, elite marathon runners. What I love about her book is um, there's like one whole chapter in particular, for example, that goes over how to carbo load for, a, for an endurance event. She's got one chapter on how much protein do you need in your diet. For you guys that are trying to manage your weight, she's got a, she's added a couple chapters on weight management and how to drop body fat. So a great book because you can read just the chapters that interest you the most. You don't have to read it from cover to cover. And she's got over 200 great recipes and um, snack ideas um, for carbo loading, just general nutrition. So it's really good. So during carbo loading, I said I would use Nancy's book. And the handout I'm going to email you guys. There's a lot of examples of like daily meal plans that I'm going to give you that you can you can kind of use. You know, kind of get a feel for, you know, and for most people, your your total calories from carbohydrates are going to go up to upwards of 70% of your diet. Um, and then obviously, if you're saturating your muscles with glucose, your body has to lay down added water weight with that, which is good because you're going to need both fluids and both glucose during the race. So um, if you're doing things right during that loading phase, two weeks out, you guys should should be gaining some weight. If you're not gaining a few pounds, then, you know, relative to your weight, obviously larger people may gain upwards of five or six pounds. Smaller people, maybe one to two pounds. But if you're doing the load right, you, you should gain some weight going into your race, and uh, so don't get concerned about that because you'll lose all that weight and probably more on race day, and it's going to make sure that you're well prepared um, and you're not going to slam into that wall at mile 18 or mile 20, okay? Average average runner has about 16 miles in the tank. If they're loaded up, we can push that beyond the wall. And, of course, during the race, you guys should be taking down electrolytes, gels, goos, um, whatever, you know, pretzels. I mean, whatever you guys normally have taken down for your to practice that during your long runs. Obviously, you want to be taking some calories down during the race, too, okay? Uh, the handout I, I'll send you gives you a lot more detail on this, but I just kind of wanted to go over the high points, okay? As far as weather, this is the one thing you can't control, but you can plan, um, plan for it. So this is the time of year when you want to start weather watching, 
make sure you have uh, diff different apparel, uh, running jackets, things like that in your closet that in, in case you do get cold weather or rainy weather, for example. Um, kind of go over the details in that, of that in the handout and how to dress for different types of conditions if it rains, if it's cold, if it's hot. Um, but generally speaking, you guys want to dress for the conditions at the time you expect to finish, not to start. So if it's cold, you may be shivering a bit at the beginning, but if the temperature is expected to go up, say, 20 degrees during that race, then obviously you want to you want to dress for those conditions, 70, for example, instead of maybe 50 if it's 50 degrees at the start, okay? And then obviously as you get closer to your race day, you, you want to really, you know, look at the extended forecast. We get about three days out. I like to bring up weather.com and look at the hour-by-hour hour forecast to see how the weather may potentially change during the race because it may, you, if you get a cold front coming in, or a warm front, you want to kind of plan for what, what to wear at the beginning and what clothing, articles of clothing you want to either ditch or pick up from friends, um, you know, along the, along the course if, if you need it, okay? The biggest thing with weather is if, if the weather is warm, especially, you know, you guys want to be willing to adjust your pacing accordingly early in the race. So if it's, if it's in, you know, upper 60s, 70s at the start, pushing up towards 80 at the finish, high humidity, you definitely want to go to plan B and bring your pacing way down early in the race um, to prevent, you know, having dehydration problems or just kind of running out of gas at the end of the race, okay? And once again, the handout gives you a little bit more information on, you know, how to prepare for weather conditions, okay? A couple of checklists I'll also include in the handout. I didn't want to go them all, I'll, I'll go over those in detail here, but a couple of helpful, you know, a race day shopping checklist. So with two weeks out, no matter where you guys live, you know, your local running stores, especially if you're running a local race in your own hometown, they, they have a tendency to get really low on staple items, socks, um, off the off the shelf items like body glide, which is a, like a roll on lubricant to prevent chafing. Um, running hats, skull caps if it gets cold, gloves for example. So you guys want to go through these checklists that I provided and you know take your checklist, print it out, take it down to um, your local running store in, in Houston. We highly recommend our sponsor, Fleet Feet Sports. Um, and get just knock out that list and don't rely on the expo. Go out there and get the things you need now. And then when you go pick up your packet at the expo, maybe make one trip through there and just pick up maybe some oddball things that maybe you couldn't find um, locally. Um, it's, it's, it's your local running stores, okay? Other than that, um, the race day drop-off bag is huge. This is the bag that you guys load up with kind of com comfortable clothes and things you're going to need as soon as you finish your race. I like to put a sports drink in there, my favorite sports drink or my favorite post-workout recovery drink. Um, a pair of sandals because you probably want get to your, get your shoes off. Uh, what else? Um, you know, if you're out of town race, you want cab fare in there in case you've got to take a cab back to your hotel room. Um, some people, you know, will plant their cell phone in there so they can take pictures after the race with their family. So I'll give you a whole rundown on those things. I'd highly recommend you stick in your gym bag or that drop-off bag that you're going to want to have readily available as soon as you cross that finish line and, um, and complete your race, okay? As far as course management, this kind of gets into how to run a course. And, you know, obviously, hopefully you guys have, if you're a marathoner, you've run a half marathon is a tune-up. If you're a half marathon or hopefully you've gone out and done at least a 10K to kind of practice, you know, your pacing, how to maneuver on the course with a bunch of people. Obviously, um, with most races, we highly encourage people um, to start slow, build into your bread and butter pace, see if you can hold that, and then at the end, if you've got some in the tank, obviously, you can pick it up the final uh, uh, miles then great, you know, burn, you know, don't leave it on the course and burn it off and kick up your pace a little bit. 
Um, but you can always, for most of the big races like Houston, there's no way around it. You're going to have to go out slow because you just got a really big crowd of people until the pacing shakes out a bit and you kind of kind of come into your own as far as, you know, your pace goal, okay? I like to set a, what I call an ABC pace goal. So B, the one in the middle being what my goal is. Um, in, in a previous webinar, we went over the Macmillan calculator and how to use Macmillan to plug in maybe a, your warm-up races at different pay, uh, distances. For example, if you ran a half marathon tune-up, putting that most recent time in, and it interpolates out and kind of tells you what, what, your pay, what pace you could expect for your goal pace for the, for the marathon, okay? Come up with your, you know, your, your B plan, which would be, you know, assuming the weather's good and everything else, what your, what your goal would be for total time and then how that breaks down to pace per mile. Uh, and then A would be, um, A would be, um, your A goal would be like one notch off of that slower. So if it's a hot day, if you're just not feeling it, having, you know, stomach problems or other things that come up, that would be a pace that you'd be willing to kind of back off to um, where you can still finish, but finish with control and not have problems late in the race. And C would be kind of one notch up. This would be if you just just the day of your lifetime. Most people aren't upgrading their pace, but if you're really feeling it, it's a great weather day, good conditions, you've got that extra extra kick left, you know, burn it at the end and see if you can maybe even better your goal. Okay, that's a pretty rare thing on a, on a marathon course. Probably easier to pull off a faster than expected time during a half marathon, obviously, because you don't have, you have, you know, half as many miles to cover, okay? We're big believers in keeping your pacing and your splits fairly consistent and controlled, and you guys will read tons of stuff on negative splits, um, which is running the second half of the marathon faster. If you go out slow and maintain a pace, you can sometimes easily do that. But for beginners and for you guys that are running your first marathon, we highly recommend having a pace goal trying to maintain that pace goal and, and stick to it. And then, if, you know, obviously if you've got some left at the end, maybe the final couple miles you can pick it up. But I want to stress that you guys don't want to get too greedy with pace because you can overpace for the first even 10K and blow your race on the back end and then you end up walking towards the end, which is not fun, okay? So keep that in mind, just keeping your splits pretty consistent. That also allows you to burn fuel um, more efficiently so you don't run out. And then what I like to do is to manage my pace and my fuel and my fluids using what we call a pace band, okay? So I want to go over to show you this quick and how you can you, you can do your own pace band here. So you guys might want to Google this. Google Runner's World Race Pace Band and, and it should come up with the run, I'm at Runner's World the UK Runners World, which actually I like this site a lot better than the, U, the US version. But so what I did here is I'm, I want to break a four-hour marathon here. So I just say you're a person that wants a 358. I put a 358 in here. Distance is a marathon. Units. We're looking at miles. I click on Create Pace Band. Okay, this is pretty cool here, guys. So what it does, it gives you your splits. So 358. Obviously, that looks like it's just over a nine-minute pace per mile, and then it gives me my splits. Then what I like to do is take this, print it on like a Tyvek envelope, and then put scotch tape over it so it's waterproof in case it rains. And then what I like to do is I like to go through here and actually color code this where I highlight, you know, say, normally I'll take down fluids every couple of miles during the race. So, you know, like say mile two is Gatorade, so I may highlight this in, in pink, you know. And then mile four, I'm taking water down. So maybe that's in blue for water. Maybe mile six, or maybe, you know, maybe at mile four I'm taking, you know, I may put a G next to it. So to remind me that mile four, about 40 minutes into my race, I'm going to take some goo down with the water. I like this because it's a no-brainer now. You you don't have to think about things. You can stick this on the same side as your Garmin or stopwatch. Look at mile six, 
what should my cumulative time be at that point? Right here, it's a 5430. So you can look at your pacing. How am I doing? Do I need to catch up a little bit? Do I need to back off? And then um, if that's a water station or a goose station or whatever, um, it's just a, a constant reminder of the fact that you've got to just kind of time release both electrolytes and calories during the race, and that'll keep you strong late in the race. Most people kind of kind of half-ass this a bit, and um, they don't get the calories in early enough in the race, and they suffer towards the end of the race. So you guys may want to try this. Um, it just works great. Other runners have done it, and a lot of all my major races, I still use a race pace band. Sometimes the Expo, you can actually get these based on your marathon goal. So if you're like a 415, you can you can usually get these. If you're in Houston, go to the Houston area Road Runners booth, and they usually have these race pace bands you can pick up that are pre-printed. Okay, but this is the easy way to kind of do it at home. Just want to tell you about that. That's a, that's huge in my opinion. So. Um, Going back to PowerPoint here, um, my course management. Um, there's my race pace. You know, you guys want to know the course. You want to know where the turns are. You want to cut the tangents. And if you're turning left, you want to take the left inside lane. And I like to actually speed up a little bit on turns because most people slow down. And I can kind of get ahead of the path, get ahead of a few folks. And I'll, I'll get into my comfort zone. I've got some elbow room a lot quicker if I take the turns pretty aggressively um, instead of just coasting through them, okay? I highly recommend walking through water stops. So when you take your water down, pull out to, over to the side so you're not in the way of runners. Grab what you need. Power walk through the water stop. Catch your breath a little bit and move on, okay? I even recommend this to you guys that are probably more experienced runners because it's not going to kill your time. It's going to take some edge off and you'll probably – have a little bit more staying power at the end of the race, okay? And if it gets really tough, it's just not your day. Go, going into a run-walk mode, even more so than just your 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 um, water breaks, um, is good. So you can go into a something is like every 10 minutes, run 10 minutes, walk one. But when you do walk, you want a power walk because you don't want your heart rate coming down too low. Gets really tough. You can bring that down to it. Eight one is six one. Galloway recommends his kind of standard five one. Five minutes of that'd be five minutes of running, one minute of walking. If you're fading late in the race, this is a great way to kind of keep the keep, keep the wheels on so you guys don't you know, blow up or hit the wall at the end of the race. Okay, so keep all that in mind. And I've got some more tips on this in the handout. Okay. As far as the course for Houston. Um, you know, half marathon course is a lot easier because you're not hitting those overpasses on Allen Parkway. Um, and in flight, we'll go over this later, but we've got different cheering stations for our group and a couple drop-off points where people can plant things here at mile 11 in West University and at mile 24 on Allen Parkway um, where you can just plant goos and things and just kind of pull over and pull them out of a, a Ziploc bag that will um, plant there for you. So. Um, going through kind of a play-by-play, -play. you know, in Houston, even though it, we're fairly flat, uh, the Houston Marathon is far from an easy course, and a lot of people come to the city expecting flat, and they find out really quick that Houston's not a cakewalk. So I want to run through real quick, if you guys aren't familiar with this, but the race starts with what they call the George R. Brown Convention Center, which is downtown. You guys motor over. A big, huge hill at the beginning where the half marathon and the marathon courses kind of merge together. So it gets very congested. And you're going over an, an overpass called the Elysian Viaduct, which goes over two major freeways. And it's a climb. So you want to go out nice and easy because that first mile is, is pretty much a climb up and down a couple times over this overpass. Okay. Then you're going through the, the historic oldest part of Houston, the Houston Heights which is called the Heights for a reason because it's the most elevated portion of Houston. So that's not easy either with some rolling hills in there. But then we're hitting through the Montrose, what we call the Museum District, Rice University. Um, down Montrose a ways is the half 
the half marathon U-turn point where the marathoners take a U-turn on Montrose and head back in on Allen Parkway as the marathoners continue through Rice, Rice University, the West, West University area, and then at mile 14, we've got another, about the halfway point, we've got another tough overpass that goes over West Park, so that's another good climb. Then the majority of the rest of the race is fairly flat. You go to the Galleria area, hook up on Memorial Drive. When you hit 610 on Memorial Drive, that's the final 10K of the race. And then as you go down Allen Parkway, you've got some elevation. You've got some kind of nasty underpasses that go up or down. You'll see a lot of runners walking this part of the course. Um, and that's where you kind of got to pull it all together because there is a gradual grade up until you get to downtown Houston and then it flattens out and you're pretty much to the to the, the finish line at that point right back where you guys started in front of the George R. Brown Convention Center okay as far as race day support now this is not for the masses but for our group um, you know we, we we've got multiple cheering stations on the course We've got an aid station, full-blown aid station at mile 24. So any of you guys that are running the Houston Marathon, even if you're not in our club, by all means, when you hit 24 and see the in-flight tent, we've got extra fluids out there for you. I mean, this is we offer this up to the whole field at 24,000. So we, there's a, there's, it's a, it's a good point. It's by Channel 11 on Allen Parkway, and it's between two water stops. And we found it's just really good. We're handing out potato chips. We've basically got a runner buffet out there, pretzels, orange slices. So if you guys need anything, even if you're not with our club, by all means, pull over and get what you need. You guys that are club members, we've got extra things stashed for you, extra things like we'll pop some Coke cans. And it's got flat Coke, Coca-Cola, in case you need a sugar fix at the end. Um, that's another place where you can plant things to pick up late in the race. We also have a, a drop-off. Uh, or a pickup point at mile 11 where you can plant things at mile 11, which we'll go into that in a second. So here's kind of a rundown. Miles, this is for our members only, with the exception of mile 24, which is kind of open up to the whole general public. But mile 6, we have a closed drop that's at Studemont in, in the Heights area, where you guys that are members, if you need to ditch your jack or whatever, you can throw it to a volunteer, and we'll pick those up, take them back to the George R. Brown, We'll have a tent at the George R. Brown where you can actually, for, for members only, you guys can drop your drop-off bag, your gym bag with us instead of having to go into the GRB and wait in line for that. Mile 11.5 is our first pickup in where you guys can, you know, marathon morning, you can put what you want to plant at mile 11 and a half, and that when you get to mile 11, you can ask a volunteer and fish whatever you need out of a Ziploc bag. Mile 14. I kind of hang out at that overpass and kind of coach you guys over the, the, the tougher part of West Park overpass. And then San Felipe at Post Oak. This is kind of by the California Pizza Kitchen off of Post Oak. We've got a cheering station there. And then we've got bike support. We have coaches kind of watching members between mile 20, mile 22, 23, from 610 all the way up to Shepherd Drive. And then... I kind of head towards the end, Coach Duvall and myself, Coach Duvall Ruiz and myself, and some volunteers kind of help shuttle runners towards the finish line as it gets pretty tough, you know, mile 24 to the finish line, okay? Uh, as far as the drop-off bins, this is kind of how it works. Um, you guys can stash anything, an extra pair of socks, um, goo, body glide, any little things, a running cap if you think it's going to get rainy later in the race. Um, and what you do is you basically put it in a Ziploc bag, write your name on it, write either mile 11.5 or mile 11 slash 24. That's mile 11 for the Houston half, which is the same as mile 24 on Allen Parkway. So these are bins that you would, these are for members only. You guys bring your stuff to the George R. Brown the morning of the race. We stick it in bins. We have a volunteer shuttle it out to those two points. So when you hit that point, you, you've got your stuff ready, and you can kind of fish it out of your Ziploc bag if you need it, okay? Um, <clears throat> we'll send you, you guys more information, out, you guys that are members, on that, okay? And then at the end of the race, you can pick up your clothes that you dropped at mile six at our tent. 
and then any items that you guys left on the course, you can get those from us, you know, uh, at a, you know, post race, or pick them up at, at Fleet Feet maybe the, the week after when we have a little our, our annual um, medal and medal and donut run the week after the Houston Marathon, the Saturday after the marathon. Okay. Just as I mentioned, these are things you guys may want to put in your pickup bins or your, your pickup uh, ziplocs. Um, socks, that's going to save you if it rains in the race. You may want to change your socks out at mile 11. Nip guards, body glide to prevent chafing and nipple abrasion. A skull cap if you think there's going to be a cold front that kicks in. Uh, a garbage bag to keep the, the, the water off you if, it, if you think there's going to be rain late in the race, things like that. Okay. Some other helpful tips, you go to Chevron, ChevronHoustonMarathon.com for the latest race info. I would kind of stay up to date on what's going on there. Like the Houston Marathon's Facebook page for updates. You guys that aren't, whether you're members or not, I would highly recommend going out to our in-flight running page. Um, go to Facebook.com slash in-flight running, like our page. And what I'm doing now on our on our on our page here, and this 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 we've got people from all over the the um, the country um, doing this or tuning into this this page. And what I've been doing is daily pre-marathon tips. I'm up to tip number nine. I'll do tip number ten tomorrow, and we'll continue this all the way up to race day on just little things you guys can do leading up to your race beyond all beyond all the information we share with you tonight. Okay. Um, We mentioned the Runner's World Race Pace Band, so check that out. Print out your own pace band and kind of figure out where you're going to take down water, Gatorade, goo, food on the course, things like that, okay? Have your friends and family sign up for runner tracking so they can track you through text and email on race day, kind of know where you're at. Um, if you're in a corral, Houston Marathon does not have the best corral system, so you guys want to push as far forward on your corral as you can to avoid getting jammed up with runners that may be a little bit slower than you or walkers that are that, that may possibly be on the course. <clears throat> Excuse me, so keep it keep that in mind. And then realize that if it's not your day, you're running the marathon. If you go if you run the half marathon course and decide, you know, halfway through you want to do that, there's a timing shift that picks up on the fact that you're off course. And they'll auto downgrade you to the half. I don't think you have a an official finish, but they do keep track of your time and auto default you to the to the half marathon. Okay, kind of a a, a built-in safety safety thing there. So just a little quote from Olympian Ryan Hall. I mean, some, sometimes you can get so caught up in a race that you just don't enjoy it. You know, so whether it's your first race. Or you're gunning for a new personal best. Love this quote by Ryan Hall, Olympian. Um, qualified for the Olympic trials here in Houston last year. His quote here: "I don't think about the miles that are coming down the road. I don't think about the mile I'm right on. Right, right, I'm on right now. I don't think about the miles I've already covered. I think about what I'm doing right now, just being lost in the moment. So, you guys want to have a plan, mile by mile." But when you're running your race, just be be in the now and just always be thinking, okay, what do I need to be working on now? What do I need to be taking down as far as fluids? And just pick pick the mile pick the miles off one at a time, and before you know it, you'll be hitting the finish line. So, also want to remind you that the finish line it's 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 more than just a line drawn across the road, guys. So, if it's your first marathon, believe me. You'll never be the same when you've taken eight months out of your life and trained for a marathon and crossed the finish line. You may cry a bit. You'll definitely throw your hands up um, in victory. <laughs> and um, every every race you run is a little bit different. But um, And you want to really pat yourself on the back for training so hard. And when you get to that finish line and earn that medal, man, it's a great feeling. So um, we've got a lot of newbies in our group gun in for the first, so we always look forward to earning a lot of medals on race day. So mention some handouts. So 
We'll have a final countdown guideline and in this PowerPoint presentation. I'll email that out to all members um, in, in the, our current members in the group. If you're a non-member and you've just tuned in because you found this on Facebook or YouTube, uh, by all means, um, no matter when you view this, if you just request the handouts by dropping me an email at info at inflightrunning.com, let us know, know that you viewed this presentation and we'll gladly send those um, handouts out, uh, out to you and um, to give the rest of the story. And just study all these things. Focus on doing the small things right in these final two weeks and uh, you'll have a great race, okay? And that's all I've got for today. Sorry I went a little bit late here, guys. It's a 40-minute presentation, but it's everything you need to know. Check out the handouts. Request them if you need them. And I want to, I want to, um, no matter what race you guys are running, if it's here in Houston or anywhere around the world, I want to wish you a great race. Run strong and Godspeed. Take care.